So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Food Management Series. I'll hand it over to our moderator, Dr. Kostu Shinde, for for the proceedings. Over to you, Kostu. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, today is the last session of our Wound Management Series. Uh, today, doc, uh, the speaker is Dr. Uh, Viraj Tambekar, sir. He is a well-known plastic surgeon from Mumbai. Uh, he will present uh, his case series and his views on management of infection uh, and difficult cases in orthopedics. Uh, we have a panelist, uh, Dr. Ajinkya Okarande. He is a plastic surgeon in Solapur. And Dr. Vikram Vag, he is a plastic surgeon in Pune. And we have Dr. Varid, he is a hand surgeon in Sancheti Hospital. Uh, thank you again. Uh, handing over to Viraj sir. Sir, please. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Viraj Tamvekar, and thank you for that very sweet introduction. Uh, I'm in practice in Mumbai for the last uh, two decades, and I do um, reconstructive work as well as aesthetic work in plastic surgery. Um, it has been a lovely series so far where we've explored the entire spectrum of problems that happen in orthopedics when there are wound infections. We ran through the first set where we spoke about technology, and Dr. Varid Altaf took us through vacuum-assisted closure therapies uh, and showed us how wounds can close. And then we had two lovely presentations on how skin grafts and flaps can be used in a large vista, large variety of cases to show how uh, wounds can be managed uh, in, in a situation where there are infection and related problems in orthopedics. What I thought is that rather than talking about technical advancements, because they had already been covered, because Typically, when you look at technical advancements, you're looking at a free flap to be the epitome of or the zenith of technical advancement. And astomosis, massive tissues being moved, composite tissues being moved. So I thought perhaps that maybe I can share my mistakes with you over the last 20 years and perhaps share what I have learned in these 20 years of doing these kind of things and where technology has helped me and how things have moved forward. So before I start, um, I would uh, just like to share my disclosures. There is no conflict of interests. I may name some products and things in the, in the course of the talk. However, I am not benefited by that in any which way. What are the problems a plastic surgeon faces or an orthopedic surgeon even faces when they have recurrent or complex wounds which are breaking down and, and infections are taking place? I think the biggest problem usually is age. And when I say age, I don't mean it more as a chronology, I mean it more as a biology, in the sense that when a person ages, there are a lot of degenerative things that take place. And when that happens, overall wound healing reduces, the quality of healing reduces, the ability for the body to create granulation tissue or even flap adherence um, uh, reduces. Uh, protein levels usually are a big problem. So all of these things are encompassed when I say the word age. As I said earlier, there are multiple comorbidities. There are, there's diabetes, which is very common in our country, ischemic heart disease, vascular problems. There could be thyroid issues, Parkinsonism, issues where the ejection fractions are not very high. So you cannot really give proper anesthesia or anesthesia for a long period for some of these patients. So these are difficult patients to manage. Plastic surgeons usually are tertiary caregivers. The primary surgeon has already done the operation. They've either fixed the bone or whatever they need to do. God forbid when there's infections, they've debrided the wound sometimes once, sometimes twice, sometimes even three times. So by the time the patient comes to the plastic surgeon for sorting out these gaping open wounds with implants inside or whatever, there is already a fair amount of vascular damage, not intentionally, but Obviously, vessels are cut when you debride, when you clean wounds and things. And also, there is secondary fibrosis and scarring, which means the pliability of the tissues, again, is not the same. So it's important to understand that these are detrimental to the overall wound healing in the bigger picture. Therefore, a proper assessment is required when the primary infection takes place. And sometimes because either people are in a hurry or because a junior person has looked at it and has just reported, oh, there's a minor wound infection. I'll take it up and debride it in the minor roti or something like that. So the, uh, the proper assessment in the primary phase 
is not, not done appropriately, thereby leading to secondary infections and things. Uh, again, as I said, multiple previous surgeries and composite tissue involvement can also create problems for the plastic surgeon. So when I get to see such kind of wounds and such problems, what do I do? I remember my teachers who told me that no matter how big or how many people have seen a wound, every time you see a wound, you are not seeing a wound, you're seeing a human being, you're seeing a patient. So go back to your basics and start with the history. What actually happened? How did things start? When was the patient completely all right? And start from there. There may be some small things which you will pick up, which will be able to help you to, to assess the problem in a better way and perhaps get the wounds to heal nicely. Examination is very, very important. Sometimes we just see, oh, it's an infected wound. We some, see some pus coming out and we say, fine, there's pus there in a wound. I have to debride it. Of course you have to debride it. But what exactly is wrong there? What is the quality of the bone? What is the quality of the granulation tissue? What is the quality of whatever slough you see there? Is it an SHR? Is it just slough? Are there sub SHR pockets of pus? What exactly is going on? Needs to be examined in great detail. After examination, you need to look at relevant investigations. Relevant investigations first to assess the general condition of the patient. So patients with comorbidities need to be evaluated thoroughly to see how they can deal with surgery if you're contemplating any kind of surgery. How long can your surgery be when you're doing it? How much blood loss can you afford? All of these things need to be assessed in great detail before you take up the patient and thus relevant investigations are needed. 2D echoes perhaps or any dobutamine stress tests or whatever is required for cardiac evaluation, pulmonary function tests for lung issues, various things that are, that are needed. The other thing is cultures. Very often when you have wounds in an orthopedic setting, which are chronic infections, not settling down, osteomyelitis could be one thing that comes to the mind. The other thing is tuberculosis. We must have a very, very low threshold to um, suspect that there could be tuberculosis infection. Therefore, repeated cultures or biopsies of tissues are important when you deal with such situations. Now, while you've assessed all of this and you've made your plans, the local condition needs to be looked at. You have to come to an anatomic diagnosis. Anatomic diagnosis meaning what are the tissues that are deficient in the wound I see? Yes, there is infection. So you will see pus, slough, etc., which we've discussed. But what is the actual loss? Is there a skin loss or can my flaps come together and get me primary closure? Is there some kind of facial loss? Is there subcutaneous tissue loss? Is there muscular loss? Have I lost some bone? What exactly is the problem that I need to fix and replace like for like as Sir Harold Gillis has told us in his principles of plastic surgery. Then you have to assess function. With this anatomic loss, what is the loss in function and how do I recover from that? So this is where you need to think of nerve transfers, etc., if need be, uh, in, in difficult problems. Now, there are two things which I really like to stress on, especially in an infection-based lecture series. One is a biofilm, and the third is the low threshold to suspect Cox, as I mentioned earlier. We will discuss this a little later when I discuss the cases. So once all this assessment and all of that is done, the general condition has been observed and seen. I think we need to look at the human angle of the whole story as well. Most of these patients are either financially drained or they've been in hospital for such a long time that they're fed up of the hospital. They don't want to see the face of a hospital. They themselves are rebellious, all of that. Relatives are usually very anxious, almost to the verge of being aggressive at some points. So the first thing you need to do is to, when you're doing your consultation, understand the mindset of the patient, the people you're treating, because they've already been treated by some other consultants. People have done good work on them, but had unfortunate results. Now, if you are supposed to be the person who's going to sort things out for them and help them, you first need to understand where they're coming from, how aggressive they are, and then calm them if need be. And in today's day and age, I think it's a very, very important thing to understand and imbibe as a part of general practice. The other thing you need to look at is their finances. If they have insurance, the insurance is usually drained out because you know repeated debrimas, et cetera, et cetera, have already been deemed done for them. So these are the kind of difficulties you will be, be facing. In any event, you need to be positive. You need to tell the people that, look, you've done this kind of stuff before and you expect that their patient will be pulled out of this horrible hole that they're in. However, never paint a very rosy picture in my experience. 
lay people don't understand what actually goes on in a human body while healing is taking place in a complex problem. They just think that, oh, if you're going to a super specialist or someone who's in inverted commas considered to be the, the expert source, they expect a magical result. But that usually doesn't happen very easily. So you need to tell them that. You also need to tell them that though this is probably the final hurdle, this is probably going to be more expensive than your primary surgery because you will need high end antibiotics, perhaps ICU care, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Most people when they come in are not prepared for this. They think, oh, last surgery, everything will be done and not cost us so much. But costs are very, very high when you kind of do the salvage work. It's always important to involve other specialists. We are plastic surgeons. We are not physicians. We are not diabetologists. We are not cardiologists. We are not nephrologists and we are not orthopedic surgeons. So we need to have all these people with us in the team so that we can together create a plan and, and pull the patient out of this problem. Gently, we must assert to the patients and the relatives that we are the boss. We are the captain of the ship as far as wound healing is concerned, but we are not God. Now, let's come down to surgery. I prefer to keep surgery very, very simple. The simpler the procedure, the simpler the thing you do, usually the better your result. I've always been asked this question by a lot of people as to what if I do incomplete debrima? In my book, you cannot do incomplete debrima. If you do debrima, it has to be complete or don't do it. The only caveat there is if a patient's general condition is so weak that they will not be able to to tolerate the blood loss associated with it or will not be able to tolerate the appropriate position in which you need to put a patient to, to do a proper debrima, then I can understand you're not doing a proper debrima. And we have something that helps us now with technological advances to cover for that. But in the earlier days when this was not available, debrima had to be complete. If there is anything dirty, necrotic in a wound, it is never going to heal. The infection will continue at some point or the other. Whether we should do closure in the same sitting or not is debatable. Depending on what you see in the wound, the general condition of the patient, protein levels, etc., you may decide to do a flap, primary closure, graft, whatever it takes to do a closure in the same sitting. But sometimes if you're not sure and you think there may be further demarcation or some more tissues may go, you're not clear if there's a biofilm and you want to get rid of that, then perhaps a delayed closure may be uh, a sensible thing to do. So when I say complete debrima, what do I mean? I mean that you need to remove all visible slough, unhealthy granulation, any cartilage and bone that does not does not look like it's healthy and will probably not survive. You need to remove all foreign bodies and implants, and you need to make sure that you've dealt with the biofilm problem correctly. I am just going to refer to biofilm as biofilm. I'm assuming everyone knows much about it because if I have to discuss the details of what a biofilm is, this presentation will probably never end because there's so much that, that goes on with the biofilm. So I'm just keeping it short um, and just calling it that. Um, I use either sharp cutting, cautery, curates, brushes of various sorts to do my debrima. And I always take cultures and biopsies as I had mentioned earlier. But this is something that I, I have started doing off late and quite frequently is using a toothbrush to do my debrima. Why this helps me is that if I have an implant in my wound, which I can't remove for some reason, you don't have those screws, little ratchets, spirals, little nooks and crannies, where no matter what you do, you can never reach with a gauze or a curette or anything. This, the bristle tip of a toothbrush gets into those areas very nicely. I'll show you a little video also where I've used it, so you'll understand what I'm saying. But it's a very, very good, simple tool. This is a regular toothbrush that you can get anywhere in the market. You ETO it, keep it on your trolley, and you can and use it and dispose it. It's not a very expensive tool to use, but it's a very useful tool to use. The other thing that I do during my process of debrima is lavage. I think lavage is, is one of the most important things you can do in a wound, and it has to be totally and completely thorough. Uh, I use a certain protocol to do my lavage, and it's, it's here up on your screen. Essentially, I start off with a chlorhexidine scrub, which has got detergent action, and at the same time, it has a antibacterial action. And I use the, the, um, the nail brush that we use for scrubbing, uh, prepping uh, before surgery to, to, to kind of clean out all the dirt from a wound. I also use a toothbrush to do that. After which I will use a lavage again, uh, the, the pulse lavage. And then I use povidone iodine with hydrogen peroxide. Then, then povidone iodine solution alone, not with hydrogen peroxide. And then again, pulse lavage with antibiotic uh, in a saline or a ringolactate solution. 
Lastly, I will use polyhexanide betaine solution, which is also called as prontosan, and this helps to deal with the uh, with the biofilm. Now, what exactly is this, and how does it work? It's essentially a bigonite, which helps to break down the the um, the biofilm. The good thing about this prontosan product is when that 350 ml vial that that it comes in, it's made specifically such that when you when you poke the top of the of the bottle and you invert it and you squeeze hard it it gives a a lavage pressure of 7 pounds per square inch and you know that between 5 to 14 is what you need to get actual jet pressure or lavage pressure to remove films and and debris from a wound so it's very nicely done so you just get that bottle into a into a sterile plastic or even even in your um, green uh, oti linen and you can just squeeze nicely and then it kind of lavages everything off now once this is done what i also do is i soak the wound completely in this solution for about 10 minutes or so because you need this chemical to act on that biofilm so once you wait for 10 it needs a little bit of patience so you wait for 10 good minutes and then you wash it all off again now in in some cases you may not want to do an immediate closure you just want to do a dressing so it's available in the form of gels as well and that's how it can work on biofilms and especially in cases where you cannot remove implants like spines tkrs etc in those situations this is a very useful tool to have in our armamentarium um then the next stage of surgery of course once everything has been cleaned and all that you decide you want to do um uh you know when i say primary closure i don't mean primary closure in the technical sense i mean closure in the same sitting so either you do an anatomical closure if the wounds are coming together or you graft flap bone fixation is very important if you are taking a, a free bone flap or or whatever is required or you decide that you want to do a delayed closure and you have many many different um tools to to um, to do the delayed closure and different dressing choices here's a quick video it's about 2 minutes long give or take that shows you the the process of debrema that i do this is a spine case uh, where there was um, uh, infection in a in a fixed spine a recurrent infection in a fixed spine so this was me first initially using a curette to debride whatever granulation tissue we saw there then using a normal saline lingual lactate with either cefuroxime or something as a pulse lavage the next stage is using chlorhexidine scrub with the toothbrush and the nail brush to clean out um whatever i could you retract the edges you see those implants exposed there and this brush goes in between those implants uh and edges and things like that over the bone this can be used on dura as well of course you have to be very very gentle uh, in this particular case the dura was exposed and the brush was used on the dura as well but really really gently but it does help to remove biofilm from there again you lavage in the povidone iodine as i had mentioned earlier with hydrogen peroxide and then eventually without hydrogen peroxide and then the prontosan was used after that sometimes once you've done everything you find that there are some bony points which are poking in the area you can use a curette a bone nibbler or whatever to or a rasp to file those off then you'd say that okay everything looks nice and clean everything's fine so you raise flaps on either side either facial cutaneous flaps or muscle flaps and you get everything together in the midline because in this particular case you could you put in suction drains this is a jackson pratt drain that i'm inserting deep uh, bang on the bone uh, and covering it with the muscle and then you put in one more so you have two drains superficial and deep i'll go to the next slide not waste time on this now a word with negative pressure wound therapy i know the dr varad had taken a lovely talk on that but just a few words on on um, negative pressure wound therapy so we've got three types of negative pressure wound therapy uh, if you would like to to call it that the first type is the regular simple suction called granny foam now what i've seen over a period of time is when the patient comes to me they have been started on this therapy by the primary treating surgeon what i feel is that most people think that oh okay this is one way for me to not have to see this patient again and again and maybe a week later i can call them back to do a dressing change unfortunately we should not keep this dressing on for 7 days or 8 days as i've seen some people doing the ideal dressing change time is about 3 to 4 days we can perhaps extend extend it up to 5 i know that this is expensive for our patients but sometimes when you're doing or using a certain technology we should use the best possible you know use the technology in the best possible and the recommended way because sometimes when you use it for longer infections can start happening between the interface between the foam and the 
and the uh, new granulation that is forming. So granny foam is essentially a dark gray foam with a certain amount of porosity connected to a vacuum suction. Everybody knows I'm not going to go ahead and describe and waste time there. So this is the granny foam that goes in. Um, sorry, let me go one stage back. So this is the granny foam that goes in and then you can layer it. Uh, and this is the couple of layers that you put on top. And this is the ceiling of the, of the vac dressing. Now you'll see that there is a track pad here. This track pad has two tubes, not one. So the regular granny foam, when you're doing vacuum assisted closure therapy alone, you have a single tube here, which just sucks out everything from the wound. It can be either intermittent or it can be um, continuous, depending on whatever you choose. Now this double track pad is a addition to what they have done, which is called as the Ulta foam installation therapy or vac veraflow therapy. In this, what happens is that at a fixed interval and the machine adjusts, uh, you adjust it on the machine, the machine does it automatically. You can actually instill normal saline into the wound. There are people who also instill prontosan into the wound, depending on whatever they choose to use. I prefer normal saline without any antibiotic or any other solution, just plain normal saline. The concept is very simple. If you have so if you've eaten some food and your vessels and your plates are all dry and you try and clean them after two hours, once all the food sticks to them and they become dry, it's very difficult to remove the food from those plates. But if you just soak those plates in, in water for about five or 10 minutes and then try and clean them, you realize it's far easier to clean. So what installation therapy does essentially is after a, a determined, a predetermined amount of time, it will instill an X amount of fluid, which also you predetermine into the wound. It soaks the wound completely. And then again, it is sucked out. And this is done intermittently. Sucking, installation, and pulling. So, uh, sucking, installation, and pulling. So when you do this in this fashion, what happens is that the wound bed foam interface gets constantly washed. And thereby, the bacterial load becomes much less. And the third thing that they've now introduced is something called as cleanse foam, which is, which is what you'll see here. I'll, I'll talk about what I've done here for a second. So typically what happens, we've also seen is when we apply the, uh, apply the um, negative pressure wound therapy, we need to seal it. And the adhesive of the transparent plastic sometimes ends up creating excoriations, ripping off epidermal layers of skin. So what I do is I apply um, either duoderm or some such material on the sides so that the plastic sticks to this and you get a nice clean edge. And especially when you're instilling fluids inside, there is no maceration of the edges around. So that is one thing I do. Then what you do is you instill this, you add this thing called the, the, the cleanse foam. This is a perforated foam. And what you do here is that you have a very rapid exchange of uh, installation fluid, suction and relaxation, suction, relaxation and installation fluid. So what happens is when you're sucking out the granulation tissue slough or whatever's left behind gets sucked into these perforations. And when you release and instill fluid, this goes away. Now the mechanical pushing and pulling of this intermittent suction release creates some amount of desloughing also. So in patients where you cannot do a complete debrima when you've taken them on table, this is a very, very useful protocol to follow. Um, so this is uh, an example of how deep a wound was initially and then how three months of back has almost brought everything to the surface, maybe another week or so and this wound could have been just simply grafted rather than use any flaps. Of course, if you're planning a delayed closure, the procedure remains essentially the same. Now, the other thing I'd like to stress is that post-op care is just as important as the actual surgery uh, in most patients. So hygiene, massage, imaging to check if there's any collections inside in the immediate post-op period for about four to six weeks is very important. You need to look at hypertrophy of scarring. Sometimes there are vague symptoms. So I, of course, this is not related to orthopedics. This is related more to cardiac surgery, but I had a patient whose sternotomy dehiscence I had closed. Everything had healed, everything was wonderful, soft, supple, everything was nice. Four months later, this patient came back saying, look, I have a weird pain in my axilla and I don't know what it is. And it's sometimes very sharp and burning. On further investigation, we realized that the infection had actually recurred and it had tracked down along the along the ribs to a more lateral position. Okay. Now, after having you know kind of discussed the entire so-called philosophy or whatever it is that I practice today, I'll just share some illustrative cases with you, which are difficult patients to treat. So um, this is a lady who was operated by somebody. A TKR was performed, uh, and unfortunately, the wound got infected. You can clearly see that the patella is is well 
completely destroyed there. They also tried to, to drill in some holes to hope that some granulation will come through. There was avascular necrosis, and, and you can see what the situation is. 64-year-old lady, hypertensive, diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, uh, weak ejection fraction. Um, she was really in very, very poor shape. We couldn't do too much for her. So we had to remove that patella. Uh, and then I decided to, to use a muscle to, to cover all the, the implants there. And this is a, a medial gastronemius flap, which has been rotated into the wound. Um, this is the, the flap after the release of the tourniquet. You're seeing how nicely the skin edges are coming together. A small flap. Was, so this is the incision for the for the uh, medial gastronemius muscle flap. I did not need any skin graft over it. I could manage to do a small flap and uh, get a primary closure here. This is what it looked like once the staples were removed. And this is a small video of this lady in the consulting room um, walking with a knee brace. She's doing much better. Unfortunately, lost to follow up for me. She probably went back to the primary orthopedic surgeon, but she's doing well. Um, the second case, again, is infected TKR. Now, this was a very, very challenging case. Um, so, so I'll quickly run through it. 86-year-old male patient. He has hypothyroidism and hypertension, no diabetes. He's had tuberculosis in the past, and he underwent a total knee replacement somewhere. Uh, this patient got infected. Um, the primary surgeon debrided the wound, cleaned it all up, and um, unfortunately, it got infected again. So they debrided. So, so at that point in time, the patients lost faith in the primary surgeon and came to Bombay. They came to Bombay Hospital, not under my care, under somebody else's care. Um, and they were, they were again uh, taken into the OT. The wound was debrided. Uh, tissues were sent for, for checking if there's any tuberculosis. The reports came back saying no tuberculosis. But unfortunately, the wound did not heal. These people got unhappy with the treatment that, that was meted out to them and went to another orthopedic surgeon outside of Bombay Hospital, who then eventually referred the patient to me. When I saw the patient, uh, he had a 1 by 0.5 centimeter ulcer with pale granulation in the primary incision cranially, a 4 by 4 centimeter ulcer with pale granulation distally in the wound. There was zero sanguinous fluid that was coming out of there, but it was not very smelly. Surprisingly, the knee had complete range of motion or almost complete range of motion. The, the calves were clean, so the gastroc donor site was nice and clean. However, the skin was very, very thin. Uh, the plan that the orthopedic surgeon had thought of was to do a revision arthroplasty and then perhaps a flap if required. This is what the wound looked like uh, after uh, or when, when the wound uh, was seen by us. Another picture of the wound. Now, when we opened up this patient, this is what we saw. The wound had had a little kind of a, um, a fibrinaceous kind of a, a pseudo membrane, if, if I can call it that, um, all along the inner linings. And this infection, though it looked relatively superficial, it tracked down all the way to the implants. The other thing that we saw, which we were very surprised about, was we had a, um, a little bit of a hole in the, in the tibia. We had no idea what this was. This is literally a big hole in the tibia. So what we decided was we took him into the OT and all the ne necrotic tissue and et cetera, we, we removed everything. The implants were sent for sonification. And after sonification was done, the femoral implant and the spacer was replaced and the tibial component, um, uh, we, we did a cement spacer. And we thought that we've achieved, you know, like a, like a good procedure and all of that because everything was nice and clean afterwards. You can see how clean everything looks here. Uh, we've got the periosteum and everything covering everything. So we said, why should we do a gastronemius for an 86 year old man, give him unnecessary uh, extra morbidity. There is good quality tissue. Everything is nicely covered. Why don't we just cover the defect with a small skin graft? And that's what we went ahead and did. Now, unfortunately, of course, and over drains, right? Now, un and, and tissues, of course, were sent for culture and all of that. Now, unfortunately, what happened is this patient was being, being seen by uh, some, some junior resident in the hospital where I operated him. And this person, without asking me, unfortunately, clamped the drain, which is what is typically done uh, in an orthopedic service because you want the tamponade effect uh, to, to create some amount of hemostasis. Now, that unfortunately made my graft float, and we had a subsequent infection of that graft. In any case, what we saw, and we saw that the graft is not looking very good, so we said that we'll send them home on a vac dressing. Now, looking at all of this picture and the kind of fibro fibrinaceous material that we saw, empirically, the physician decided to start him on anti-tubercular medication. Now, 
over a period in time, we realized that this is what was happening to the wound. We realized that this is what was happening to the wound. And um, the graft had completely was completely vanished over a period in time in spite of doing a vacuum assisted closure dressing. So what we did was we waited for some amount of time for the tier, the AKT to, to, to take, uh, take action. And then in this interim period, he developed a severe urinary tract infection resistant to everything. He, he collapsed, he was taken to the ICU not once, but two times actually during this entire episode of what was happening. So we decided that, look, now time has come to remove the implant because this is all now gone completely all the way through into the implant space and everything. So we took him in, we took him into the thorough debrima. We followed the protocol that I've mentioned before. We instilled stepto uh, streptomycin in the wound, in the marrow cavities. We put Sedgard in there in the various cavities to, to, to create some hemostasis. And I rotated a, a medial transposition flap to cover whatever defect there was on, uh, over drains. Um, so I don't know why this is. Uh, just a second. It's not moving to the next slide for some reason. Um, okay, there we go. So unfortunately, in spite of whatever we did, the wound broke down laterally. I don't know why that happened, but it was not a very major breakdown. As you can see in this video, the, the skin edges were coming together very nicely. But I said, let me not take a chance because whenever in doubt, I always prefer to, to do a flap. So we took him into OT again and under local, I did one more flap for him. Um, sorry. So yeah, so we did a laterally based flap this time, uh, swung it across, put a small graft there and this wound eventually healed. Now, this entire process took almost three and a half months. And what you will also see here is that though we removed all his implants, there is a kind of a fibrous syndesmosis that has taken place there where everything is healed nicely. Both the flaps, the medially rotated flap and the laterally rotated flap have sat nicely. The skin grafted areas are good. But what happened over a period of time, perhaps due to the pull of the hamstrings or what, we, we are really not sure, but the femur overrode the tibia. And here you can see the overriding of the, of the femur. He was in a brace, but the good thing here was that because of that fibrous syndesmosis, he had flexion. He had about 75 degrees flexion of the knee. And when he used his vasti muscles, he could actually straighten this limb. So this man could actually walk. So I've, I've lost him to follow up. He hasn't come and seen me. But the primary orthopedic surgeon told me that he is actually walking using a knee brace. Even with that 75 degree flexion, he's able to straighten that leg completely uh, and use the knee brace. And he's bearing weight on it and walking. So the man is actually ambulant. So in spite of all of these problems, recurrent wound infections, et cetera, et cetera, in an 86 year old man, we were able to pull him out of it. In the interim, there was some suspicion that he could have Parkinsonism and all of that, but, but nothing like that happened. My third case is actually a quite a devastating case. This 75 year old lady um, had a bilateral PKR done, uh, and then she fell in a bathroom, unfortunately, and fractured the left patella. So the, so the problem was that the left patella got fractured. They debrided it and they did a patellectomy and all of that, but that wound gaped. When that wound gaped, they called in a plastic surgeon at another hospital who did two flaps to cover that defect. He did a medial musculocutaneous gastrocnemius flap and a lateral musculocutaneous, uh, uh, musculocutaneous gastrocnemius flap to cover both sides. The, the defect was quite large because of the recurrent infection. So he used that and he grafted the the donor site. And this is how the patient presented to me because they thought that they had lost it all. There was further infection in this wound and um, they really didn't know what to do. And they told the, uh, the relative that we need to do an amputation for this patient. The son of this patient is a general practitioner. So from somewhere he came to me and said, look, can we do something? So of course, after all of the counseling and all of that, we decided that we need to take this patient into OT, remove whatever implants are there. Because if you keep the implants in, in a situation like this, it's going to be very difficult to resurrect these problems. Uh, this is the medial, um, where's my arrow here? This is the medial gastrocnemius musculocutaneous flap. And you can see all of it is necrosed. So this must have gone and covered this much area. All of it is completely necrosed. That is the lateral flap. All of that is completely necrosed. Now, what you're seeing here, of course, you can make out from the granulation that this is not the first presentation uh, picture. This is after a couple of vac dressings. So what we did was we took this patient into the OT, cleaned out everything, removed all the implants, did a thorough debrima as per protocol, and put just simple vac initially to just try and see if the granulation will fill. I'm sorry, we did a vac veriflow for her to see if the granulation will fill nicely. This is a picture taken from the foot end of the patient to show you the marrow cavity of the femur. 
and the other one obviously was from the opposite end to show you the tibia so back dressings were done and and we continue to do this in in the hope back wire flow dressings in the hope that you know the granulation will grow up and then we can do a something we can do another flap there and and cover the the area and this patient can then walk with a fibrous syndesmosis like the other patients walked unfortunately um one of our cultures revealed mucor mycosis sensitive to only amphoterosin b in this situation so what we found was every time we were going in you can see this little yellowish thing now typically in mucor mycosis you will see a vascular thrombosis you will see black colored tissue there but we could see nothing black it was a very strange presentation of mucor mycosis which is why i thought i would share this case with you and then we had to wait of course for about 6 weeks of amphoterosin b therapy before we could do anything for this patient remember she's 80 she was again in a mid 70s not 80 plus sorry in mid 70s so once everything got a little better and the amphoterosin had kicked in you can see now start seeing some granulation coming from the bone in any case though there was such a since there was such a large hollowing of this area we decided to reduce the bone length also so what i did was i did a vastus medialis flap now one of the things that you could think of is why don't you do a free flap here like probably do a latissimus dorsi or something and just interpose the muscle in between and cover it up a uh, 75 year old lady multiple comorbidities there was no way in which we would tolerate a, a free flap surgery which is why all this um, was thought of and she had already undergone multiple surgeries before so we did a, a vastus medialis flap rotated it into place and um, this is the shortening of the bone we've shortened about 2 inches of bone of the femur that's the cut end of the the healthy cut end of the femur um and this was brought into place and and this is the uh, wound uh, the first dressing of the wound showing all the flaps are intact uh, this is now unfortunately i don't have too many post op good quality pictures of hers but uh, this is the flap that has rotated into place this is the donor site of the gastrocnemius um, uh, flaps which were taken which i had to regraft actually because we lost all of those grafts as well so then we gave her a, a caliper of this form with a uh, with a uh, height correction uh, foam and this is her at home this is the right leg which was unaffected now why you seeing all these dressings here is because she developed bed uh, a pressure sore here so this is i think a fairly good outcome in a in a difficult uh, problem for a patient now while all of this was happening there were bed sores at the tendo achilles area on both heels and these were being treated conservatively with dressings etc this is the same patient standing up with that thing and even using a walker i don't have a video of her walking this is sent from home obviously right now this is the right side leg so we debrided it backed it and then subsequently put a graft on it now this is the left one where we had all these problems with the tkr and what happened is every time we went in and debrided and did a vac we found more and more infection taking place and eventually we realized that the entire calcaneum has become porous so at last after achieving all of this we had to decide to go ahead and do an amputation for this lady so it's a sad tragic outcome in her particular case but at least that leg for a long while she was able to walk on it until the the pressure sores eventually you know made us do an amputation for her but she's still around and and doing quite well um, at home uh, the next case is a spine case this is a pot spine 45 year old lady with diabetes mellitus recurrent infections this is how she presented to me on the briding we saw that these implants were in place obviously you can't take them off i did a facial cutaneous flap after the other protocols that we've mentioned and this is a heel this is the heel wound another case this is a case of polytrauma i'll quickly rush through these now just two more cases this is a 35 year old girl a 34 year old girl mother of two mother of one child they had gone uh, to do an inspection of their farmhouse and they have these lifts which are on the outside of of a construction site the entire family was going up in the lift the lift collapsed everyone in the family passed away except this woman she had multiple level spinal fractures dislocations anterior as well as posterior and she had a ischium fracture as well so the orthopedic surgeon under whom she was admitted went and did the ischium repair he went and did a posterior and an anterior fixation of of uh, the spine she also had multiple rib fractures there was pneumothorax she also had pneumo sorry pneumo humothorax from which she pulled out of her, her general condition was very very poor though she was 34 years old she was she was really in in poor shape when when she was referred to me for recurrent infections so the first thing that happened is that the anterior repair wound broke down and um, uh, they they had to do a debrima there then the ischial wound broke down they had to do a debrima there that healed primarily then 
pus started coming out from the wound at the back and that's when i was called into the picture so when i saw the wound initially it looked like okay there is there is a wound there and there is then there are some implants exposed but when i took a video and i took her into the ot and did proper retraction you can see the anterior fixation from the posterior approach so this is just the back that's opened up and you're actually seeing the implants in there beneath those anterior uh, implants uh, do i have an arrow here no so beneath those anterior implants literally was the the uh, periosteum uh, the the peritoneum so what we did was we decided to do back varifero therapy in her case because she couldn't tolerate surgery for a very long period because then she had also developed a, a pseudo cyst of the pancreas due to the trauma that she'd had to the ribs um she also had a pulmonary embolism for which she was taken uh, back to the icu uh, twice uh, they had to treat her with uh, anticoagulants and things the physicians then she developed recurrent urinary tract infections so this was quite a mess and it was really qu getting quite impossible but in about 15 days or, or maybe about 2 weeks time we achieved we achieved so much granulation cover as compared to what we had in the initial wound with the protocol that we followed and we thought that look now we are looking at at a good outcome in this young lady where everything seems to be filling up slowly this is the amount of granulation that filled up now at this stage i could have said okay let me go ahead and do a uh, a closure now because the the wound edges are not too far apart and i think perhaps i made a mistake here wherein i went and sorry i just need to go back i i made a mistake here where i should have probably closed her at that same point in time but the family was extremely nervous about the whole thing and they said that they didn't want any chances of recurrence of infection because they've seen so much happening so i decided that because these implants can't be removed let me wait till vacuum assisted closure covers the implants completely with granulation and then i will attempt a closure it took us 3 months and this is the amount of of granulation cover we could achieve this is a picture i've shown you before unfortunately due to severe urosepsis resist which was pan resistant resistant even to colistin this lady succumbed due to to septicemia so unfortunate outcome in this particular case but um um you know this is what happens sometimes we achieved a good bit in terms of retaining the implants and almost getting primary cover it's strange but at the same time i had this 76 year old lady referred by the same spine surgeon who again presented with this kind of a picture she had um, a slightly swaying altered kind of a gait and there was a spinal deformity for which they had done multi level fixation and fusion at one level as well so there were a lot of implants in place which obviously could not be removed but she had a lot of comorbid conditions a very difficult patient to treat because she had diabetes hypertension ischemic heart disease her rejection fraction was some 25 30% she had pulmonary hypertension because of that hypothyroidism and again recurrent uti so with all of this same protocols were followed this is a picture of what it looked like in the ot the first time i saw her this is the amount of hardware that was exposed um i don't know yeah this is a small video of the flap being raised once the protocols that i'd mentioned earlier were followed a uh, facial cutaneous flap was raised and then was brought together in the midline as you can see here the facial cutaneous flap with the drain uh, covering um uh, the the hardware and then subsequently wound healing and this is a more recent picture of her completely healed wound um this is all i have to say today so in in summary i'm sorry this this presentation looks kind of um uh partly kind of in a kind of an incomplete presentation uh, it's because i was putting some finishing touches to it and i didn't add the last slide sorry about that but essentially what i'd like to say and in summarize is that when you look at wound management in in, in a series in in a, in a set of orthopedic patients it's not just simply about our knowledge base and what we are able to do sometimes we have very very difficult cases so we have to be humble and look at our other colleagues to help us to manage these patients we need to go back to basics and start from the beginning and and step up the reconstructive ladder to to get these patients to heal properly sometimes we succeed sometimes we don't but that's fate but in this entire process as healers as physicians we must support the family and the caregivers all through to try and get a good outcome thank you very much for a patient listening Yeah, thank you, Doctor Viraj. Viraj, it was it was a very very nice presentation, I must say. Uh, being an orthopedic surgeon, I have been multiple times being uh, involved in 
debridements of these uh, kind of situations which you had shown and i know it's really a nightmare and it's very difficult to get out of situations like this when there is an infected tk or an infected spine instrumentation so you have shown a wonderful series of cases even i remember uh, being uh, amputations being done in many of these such situations when the uh, tkr gets infected and they even are so resistant they don't uh, they don't even go well for fusion as well so you have you have uh, shown a very good cases i think we'll uh, have some discussion from the panelists yes excellent presentation sir uh, from the first slide i actually uh, uh, like that uh, sentence like uh, what our teachers have taught us uh, start the history when uh, the patient was completely normal uh, that was the sentence uh, that was taught to us also uh, because what happens is we just uh, uh look at the patient from the complication watch which, uh, which for which he has come but uh, actually most of the time some uh, problem was there initially before uh, anything has happened and many a times like uh, complications uh, vascular complications and many things are there which uh, the primary surgeon might have missed and uh, taking a full history gives uh, that idea uh that uh, is very important in giving a complete uh, treatment or not having further complications from our side uh, the uh, complications the this was the excellent series of complications and complicated cases uh very rarely we uh, get to see so much uh, uh, multiple complicated cases and then uh, salvage them uh, with uh, with this much good results uh excellent presentation i think i'm open to taking any questions if there are any questions of any sort happy to take questions yeah yes sir good evening Hello. it was an excellent presentation sir uh, first of all i would also like to appreciate one thing sir that you've shown such amazing and complicated cases of problem wounds and one more thing that uh, not many surgeons would accept is that apart from showing the successful results you did show one of the patients who also succumbed and that honesty really really carries uh, a lot of weight i wanted to know which is that equipment which was used in one of the videos for giving that pulsed lavage sir that plastic uh, particular round equipment was there okay so this is uh, very commonly available with most uh, orthopedic surgeons who do tkr it's called a pulse lavage system it comes as a package and it's like a gun uh, it's almost like your drills right so you have a reverse and a forward so it also has two ratchets to it which you can increase the pressure so you can have a fast moving jet of water coming very frequently or you can have a large quantity in a smaller pulse the pulse is uh, is um, i would say is a more varied pulse it's a longer pulse so two different settings to it it has two tubes one is a suction tube and the other is an installation tube typically you connect it to a 3 liter normal saline or a ring lactate bottle and what it does is it has a battery pack as well so when you press the switch the battery pack electrically has a motor inside it which will drive the water in the form of a pulse through the tip it's a jet tip now when you do so also there are two tips there one is you saw like a funnel the other one is like a stick um so when you remove that uh, attachment and you put the stick attachment you can go actually deep into a marrow cavity and do a lavage there most orthopedic surgeons have it as a part of their regular armament in fact i saw it for the first time in an ortho ot thank you sir yeah. hello am i audible yes yes very much yeah yeah uh, excellent uh, presentation sir it was technically and practically comprehensive one Uh, especially the biofilm concept uh, was too good uh, your spine cases were also extraordinary uh, i would like to know sir uh, what are your options for tkr and uh, spine hardware exposed cases from easy to difficult flaps um so you are asking me my choice of flaps to cover these uh So from easy to difficult so that in future we will be able to do all these things so um typically it all depends on how the patient presents to you i think um if the primary defect is not very large 
and you can get cover over the implant like i showed in that elderly man's case in the first sit sitting you can actually get away with just a simple skin grafting in the other case i also showed just the local closure of the skin by by putting in a in a muscle over the uh, implants and then the skin was coming together well so i think the assessment that is required is firstly what are my uh, anatomical losses there what all do i need to fill up do i need skin do i need muscle or is there something else that i can do uh, once that has been done i will choose the simplest option first because most of these patients because they are recurrently infected and there's hardware inside as plastic surgeons if we think that yes tomorrow this person can get infected and come back to me again then i think we are better serving the patient rather than not if we imagine that what we are doing is the last surgery for them probably we are being too overconfident so we must be humble and do the simplest option first if we find that we cannot graft this or do a primary closure then i would think of a local flap for the standard ladder of reconstruction and the gastrocnemius is a fabulous muscle i do not like to use the gastrocnemius with the skin simply because the donor site morbidity is so severe that you know it's really not required also a nice uh, incision about an in inch or so away from the medial border of the tibia the your bang on the muscle you can separate between the muscle the gastrocnemius and the soleus very easily you get into the median raphe just rotate it over it takes for 15 20 minutes to do it's hardly any time it can be done really quickly and you just tunnel it through there and it sits very nicely over all the hardware that you need if there is a skin defect at that point a graft is a very good good option i have some cases like that unfortunately since i was looking at at uh, talking about a philosophy or a thought process and complications i didn't share those i have a fair bit of a series of those kind of closures as well now the epitome of closure would be a free flap like i showed in that lady who had to eventually do an amputation for ideally a free flap would have been good but see we also need to understand dr ajinkya that if i want to do a free flap is my patient going to tolerate it then there is already cost right so the number of time the the, the time that it takes to do all of all the free flaps again ot costs etc etc and i work in a corporate setup and you know how it is there every minute in the ot is money from the patient's pocket so i would use as simple a procedure as i can to to cover whatever hardware i see open the more important thing is the protocol of debrema i think if that is followed very very strictly and nicely we serve our patients better sir so regarding spine options of flap the same so frankly with spine so far i think i've been blessed i've been able to get primary you know kind of closures by just advancing muscle and and closing it but like see look there are multiple flaps we can use perforator based flaps we can you know turn them around propeller flaps we can do multiple kinds of things but the simpler the procedure the better it is because then you're reserving all these complex problems uh, complex solutions if in case there is further problems and further infections and further loss of tissue keep uh, it as simple as question possible. sir sorry go ahead uh, what is your threshold for removal of implants in both these scenarios spine hardware and tkr so spine implant hardware removal. spine hardware you just can't remove you remove the hardware in a spine it collapses patient probably might die or have paraplegia so you cannot remove uh, spine hardware at all there is absolutely no option there so you keep trying keep trying biofilm ye wo you know you just do what you have to uh, until you can get some form of closure as far as tkr is concerned i would like to give it a shot to try and preserve the implants the orthopedic surgeon that i typically work with uh, will remove all the implants we will do sonification they are sent down to the lab the path lab um, where they have a machine that you know under ultrasonography it just removes all the biofilm everything from the implants and then it's autoclaved doubly autoclaved and brought back to us on the table so we wait in the ot while all of this is happening in the meantime we are debriding etc and cleaning up using you know like the protocol that i mentioned and we will put that implant back and try and get primary uh, whatever cover we can at that moment in time unfortunately if it gets recurrently infected like you saw in the the elderly uh, gentleman's case that i mentioned to you he had i mean tuberculosis right so it just came back again and again his immunity was low he was on antibiotics for a long time now in a situation like that where you see nothing else happening then you just have to remove the implant so why i shared those cases was that when i've spoken to orthopedic surgeons some of my batchmates friends here and there you meet people uh, the thought generally is that when you have a devastated tkr and if you remove the implant it is better to do an amputation for the patient 
what i'm trying to say here is that it may not be the best option for the patient we can try to get a fibrous syndesmosis and if we can get a fibrous syndesmosis between the two bony ends and a length correction boot and give them a brace they are actually going to be able to lock the brace walk at least with a walker or something basically to the bathroom to the dining table at least some amount of ambulation and then when they are sitting you unlock the brace so the knee kind of bends at 90 degrees because of the fibrous syndesmosis so that is what my approach would be for tkr implant do not remove unless you have to remove give it a shot you don't have to do primary closure at the time of your your first debridement put a vac vera flow if required for a little while so that you get some granulation going around the place try and rotate some flap in there now in a younger patient someone who can tolerate it it would be great to put an ld or something on that uh, on that area because the vascularity that the ld brings also will help get wound cover so that is where i would perhaps maybe even do a primary microvascular procedure for a patient with this thank you thank you sir Yeah. So, any other questions? I think uh, that was uh, excellent uh, description. Uh, probably all the uh, questions in my mind were cleared. Uh, so, I just like to say thank you to everybody for having me uh, on your panel and, and on your channel, um, and to give me a chance to speak and probably share my unfortunate experiences with you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. Thank you. We'll Thank have you. another uh, session uh, next time. We may plan some good uh, cases and uh, good case discussion also. We'll plan that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.